Hello ladies and gents, welcome back. I have been very very busy lately, no streams, no fun times really, but uh, here I am coming at you with two games. One of them was actually brought to my attention by a student of mine. I did know of course about the game, but never occurred to me to make a uh, not a classics out of it, until I started analyzing it with the intention of uh, making a video out of it. And um, then I noticed that certain lines in that game showed a very very strong resemblance to a very very famous you know, classic and then I thought I have got my material so here I am presenting to you two games once again because I believe that there is a firm connection between the two and I also believe that uh, the player who played the second game as a black uh, I happen to know him a little bit um, I'm certain that he knew about this one which is none other than the very famous Rot Levy Rubinstein game um, an absolute all-time classics, a lot of classic, a lot of people consider this to be one of their favorite uh, game of chess ever, and rightly so. Um, Rotlevi play, Rot played this game rather poorly, but uh, as I have expressed this already on many an occasion, um, it's very difficult to produce a chess masterpiece without your opponent at one point um, a little bit slipping and not playing the very best of moves. That being said, the second game will be very very tightly contested and consequently far more complicated um yeah so here did take c5 was the move the correct move is one of those very rare occasions and this is why chess is so beautiful and complicated at the same time is a free which normally is a total lemon but here the purpose of the move is to wait for the bishop to move so that then we can take and then we can play b4 with the tempo and then bishop b2 can come out in very harmonious lovely development Instead, Rotlevi took on c5 instantly. It's a very, very bad move, really, because it doesn't allow black to lose a tempo, so to speak, on getting the bishop out to c5. And instead of doing it in two, he got there in one move. a3 was played, a6, um, and b4, and then bishop back. So if we compare it to this variation that I showed you here after a3, if I do play this, then compared to the game, black has a very important a6 in, which is also crucial to deny knight b5 but also to float the idea of taking and get b5 in with the tempo so uh, a6 b4 bishop back bishop b2 castles very logical moves for both sides queen d2 a very iffy move really the queen doesn't belong to d2 in these structures i suspect he wanted to keep pressure on the d5 pawn which by the way can't be captured due to the usual tactic was based on bishop takes b4 check picking up the free queen perhaps he wanted to bring all the big guys onto it but this is a bit of a caveman policy here and it's never gonna even work out he just played queen e7 actually sacking the pawn know that taking it is essentially suicidal because knight takes knight takes queen takes rook d8 or even bishop e6 puts white way ahead in development in fact after rook d8 black has bishop takes b4 I invite you to play that out on your board to see how that works. Um, and so he bail out here with bishop d3, but again, instead of uh, not winning a tempo on the a3 earlier, now he's losing another one on moving his bishop twice. So we are going to end up in a very paradox situation where after a couple of moves we have a symmetrical position with black having two extra tempos. So if the rook was here, we would be symmetrical. Instead, the rook is here. And on top of that, it's black to move. Now, from here on, black is playing an absolutely awesome game and a beautiful attack. Starts off with knight e5. Note how this is the beginning of a kingside attack in that he trades off a queen side piece for a kingside one. And after this trade, all the remaining black pieces are pointing onto the white king, which has literally zero defenders around it. If in your head you cut the board half between the E and D files, you will realize that there are literally zero pieces around the white king to defend it. So you chuck F4 in, which to some extent seems logical, because at least it cuts this diagonal down. Mind you, it strengthens this one. And after bishop C7, he went with the very ambitious E4. Now here already black is way ahead um, and the reason for that is because whilst this setup is ideal for white but he would need to have this bishop probably on e3 to cover this diagonal he would also need to have a rook already in place so yeah the 
the pawns here and here are fine, but not with the way how the white pieces are laid out. This is very, very clumsy as is, and will be punished severely. Black, because if he was a good boy and learned from my Chestersons, he brings all the guys to the party. Rook c8, ready to go with check, opening up all the diagonals and all the files onto the white pieces. A beautiful display. Look at that. Two bishops beautifully murdering down that way, and the two rooks are killing the two open files. Beautiful. When you have got such beautifully organized pieces that aesthetically look alright, almost always you find that they are actually not only aesthetically best placed, but they are also doing the best possible job where they are. King h1, and the fireworks begin with knight g4. Queen can take, well, queen, queen can take, but of course then comes rook takes d3, penetrating the d-file, hitting the knight and still maintaining, in fact, increasing the incredible firepower of the two bishops. Instead went bishop e4, trying to simplify the position, and this is where the genius of, of, of Rubinstein's uh, got through. He played queen h4, which at first sight looks like a lemon, really, because after g3 it seems that Excuse me, the queen is hanging, the bishop is hanging, and although we can take it with a check, but after knight takes e4, there doesn't seem to be anything flash pulled back. However, there is something incredibly flash e4 black, and that is this amazing queen sacrifice. Clearly, Rubinstein was also watching my streams recently because he learned that the queen is a useless piece. And its best purpose is to sacrifice it away at the right time, which is precisely what black has done. Note that the, one of the main ideas is that now after bishop takes, we basically just remove the defender. And now after bishop takes, queen takes, we have a mate. That's the number one motive behind taking the knight, but still, I'm pretty sure you're dying to know why can't we take the queen. There comes a second absolute uh, bomb exploding in white's face. Rook d2, holy cow. Now we have elim eliminated one defender, and now we are going for the second dude, uh, and that is the queen, so that after queen takes we can pick up this cherry on e4. If the queen takes on g4, then bishop takes f3, check, wins uh, 75 pieces in a row, and uh, white is going to be absolutely dead after subsequent captures on f3. Three, so there was not much left really in the position. If bishop takes c3, then rook e2 is going to create a similar mate threat that is absolutely unstoppable, as in in the game. But the game scenario allowed black to execute the most beautiful pattern, which was queen takes rook, bishop takes bishop check, the queen had to block, and now the rook swung across to h3, creating the unstoppable rook h2 checkmate threat, and that was the moment when. Uh, white through in the towel wow just wow what a game an absolute gem a true pearl from chess history there for you i highly recommend you if this was the first time you saw it to play through again the game and try to figure out all the variations and how they work and potentially some of the lines that i might have forgotten uh, and didn't mention them now from here we are actually going to go forward in time almost a hundred years in fact yes just shy of a hundred years and we land in an incredible game between two of the greatest titans of chess of present era the game was played in 2013 and uh, our two titans um, are in the white trunks uh, several time world champion Wishy Anand and in the black trunks uh, the Armenian Wunderkid Aronyan, Levon, Levon Aronyan, who has been in the top five of the world elite for as long as I can remember. And um, as you will see, there will be some analogies between this game and the previous one, which is why I decided to mesh them together. The opening is uh, the extremely popular semi-slav, and even within that line, we are playing the bishop d6 variation. This is a bit of a, um, a uh, newer fashion in the history of the same Slav, the older lines with bishop b7 followed by b4 and c5 and uh, the weight variation with a6, uh, e4, c5 also used to be more popular. 
This one sort of picked up partly because of uh, Aranyan's very very hard work in fact on both sides of this variation. He has produced a few classics uh, on both sides of this line. So without further ado we are going to jump into the main theoretical line. Oh, I forgot to tell you, so in contrast to the bishop b7 and the a6 variations, with bishop d6, black basically announces that he very often wants to bite into the center with e5 instead of the traditional or more usual c5 push. Castles, castles, bishop b7. Look at how both sides are trying to complete development. Now, once again, we see this uh, bunny that you would hear me preaching against once again a very logical move in the sense that black wants sorry white wants to shut black c5 breakout down with b4 and if he were to succeed then uh, even if I do break out with e5 as long as white doesn't respond this bishop is done forever and very often white is actually pursuing this strategy to the full and this game is actually a testament to not allowing it rook c8 was played I actually don't know what's wrong with b4 here, but I'm assuming that after a5, it's impossible to hang on to the pawn. So if rook b1, then after queen e7, uh, there is just too much tension here and white can't maintain it. Consequently, knight g5 was played, which looks like a very, very silly cheapy. But the point of this move is that if black takes notice of the pawn uh, hanging on h7, which used to be the main theoretical line, by the way, before this game was played, then white jumps back to e4. And the idea again is that after trade trade, the bishop is hanging, and if I drop back, then white gets to shut down the c5 business once and for all. And again, black is in a ridiculously passive position. Very, very ugly story. So here comes though the big story, and from here on this game is literally bonkers and totally out of control. First of all, there is this bishop h2 check line that we need to talk about because the g5 knight is hanging and so we can pick it up. However, after king g1, queen takes g5, f3 exclamation mark, standing for excellent move, uh, black is in a little bit of a trouble here because I can't take on e3 due to queen d2 or queen f2, either would do to pick up the knight, and so I have to come back and if I have to do that, then after b4, once again, white has achieved a beautiful strategical victory. As a matter of fact, uh, being a pawn down is far less important than managing to shut down the bishop forever and keeping the two bishop for himself. So despite being a pawn down, white is actually ahead here. A beautiful variation to demonstrate that the greed and materialistic thinking is almost always bad. Like most people would feel an almost irresistible temptation to pinch that, go in, take the knight and then think to themselves that okay if I can't mate even then in the worst case scenario I will be a pawn up and that's just not good enough so this is modern chess for you it's just not good enough thinking or sorry rather I should say it's not deep enough thinking because if we actually go through that line which I'm just drawing now um, then we will notice that in fact it's nowhere near good enough it's actually pretty bad because uh, yes we are pulling up and no we can't move a simple muscle and even after e5 which is very thematic wife can just totally ignore it as long as I don't take and therefore I deny c5 the whole entire queen side in particular the bishop on b7 is not participating in the game essentially white is a piece ahead it's a very complex position I would not like to be on either side Black I would hate to be because, um, yeah, I feel my position is very passive. Why? Because I would be afraid that I wouldn't be able to utilize the beautiful uh, position that he has now. But nonetheless, this was an amazing example here of thinking a bigger picture and going for more. If you will, in some ways, it's actually greed. And I like this kind of greed. I'm not settling for a little. I want more. And c5 is just such an aesthetically pleasing move. It brings the last piece into the game, cracks open the two bishop diagonals, first analogy here with the previous game. Uh, it also opens up the c file onto the queen. It will be a super important pin throughout the game. And most importantly, it spectacularly doesn't give 
any notice to the fact that this is hanging. Like he just goes like, nay, go for it buddy, I'm ahead in development, I'm gonna hunt your king, and this check is neither here nor there, in fact now this bishop is very badly stuck in, and potentially now this is gonna become a very nasty threat. So he took with the knight, knight g4 was played, white relentlessly, black that is, relentlessly pursues his attack and it's beautiful the way it unfolds. Uh, I analyzed with a student of mine h3 here which wasn't played in the game and I was quite proud of the fact that I found bishop, bishop h2 for black. The reason why queen h4 is not good enough here is because of f4 and now we managed to shut down this diagonal and black doesn't have enough so we need to sneak in this check first so that now after queen here we are threatened with queen takes h3. Let's turn it again to the bishop. And if f3, then we have got bishop drop back. Now the deadly threat is queen in and mate. And if he goes king g1, we still go in. Absolute beauty. If they take, we just calmly take on d4. The check is not running away. Remember here, the Nimzovician wisdom, that when you have got a threat, don't waste it or don't cash in early. Build up, continue creating threats. Now we have got a new one here, a new one here, and if they take back, here comes the icing on the cake. This game is just, oh my god, mind-blowingly beautiful. Knight c5. Wow! It is just insanity, and for the first, but definitely not the last time, we are seeing an example where the black pieces absolutely dominate the white army by simply being better placed. And I will refer to it later on, but normally when we experience domination on the board, we either see it with very few pieces left, and the dominated ones are very poorly cornered by the, the dominees, if you will. Or if there are more pieces on the board, then one side would have a tremendous space advantage that would allow them to dominate the other side. And that's why this example is so difficult to understand and to calculate, because it's neither. It's a very open position and the only thing black is banking on is a better functioning piece coordination, if you will, or a more point-driven development. So we have got this pin, we have got this mate threat and we have got this mate threat. All black pieces are very specifically occupying those squares with a very clear goal. None of the white pieces give you this impression. And that's what allows this beautiful move. The whole idea, of course, is just to take this bishop. That, funnily enough, doesn't have any squares to go to. It's amazing. For starters, take loses to take stakes and then mate here. That's beauty. Note how we can't block on f2, because then we get mated here, owing to the pin. And finally, I just figured this out while I was speaking, if knight, uh, sorry, bishop here, and we have got the incredible knight e4, which makes this checkmate threat unstoppable. <laughs> and all this in the midst of us being a piece down, having a hanging rook, and chucking another piece on prey. This is basically the Morpheus, the, Morph, the Morphe chess principles, initiative, development, advantage, waking in a 21st century example picture perfectly presented and against oh my word a world-class player in fact several time world champion and this wasn't even played it was better than this because what happened after 9g4 was that Danan played f4 having seen all of this and in fact here I would hazard to say that most grandmasters would fail finding the correct move I would 100% no way I would find the right continuation here which is just shocking. Black simply took on d4, once again renewing the pin. And by the way, many of the previous lines, as I said, were very reminiscent of the Rotlevy business. But wait, he took back and he just played bishop c5. Holy cow! That is just, it should be illegal to be this awesome at chess. This is just next level stuff, even on GM level chess. 
the idea is that if you take once again after knight takes c5 the jaw of threat of knight takes d3 and queen d4 check cannot be sufficiently prevented it is just bonkers like somehow this game the d3 bishop which is more often than not absolutely perfectly placed on the board is just the worst piece and it's just you can't manage it and all this is happening with a piece down in the rook hanging for example if knight takes f1 which is a legit line then we take knight d3 and now queen d4 check can't be stopped h3 is forced actually to at least avoid the back uh, the smothered mate check 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 king h2 and after king takes f8 material even testament to this whole beautiful play of by white uh, black and white is still totally dominated and can hardly move a muscle this is just epic so beautiful chess amazing stuff this move like oh my word it just takes one breath away. Breath away. Like look at the, it is actually well worth setting it up for yourself and try to find sensible defending moves. If I recall rightly, according to Stockfish, the best defending move for white here, which still is inferior, is bishop g6. I mean, who even thinks about that as a move? Unreal. Anyway, there is still more to come. Seeing all this, Anand plays bishop e2. Very measured, very calm, very cool defense. I really like it. He says, fine, you take me on d4, I walk away. Now you can't kill me here because I take the very troublesome knight. And if you chuck in there, thank you very much. I will sack an exchange and take this. And I will try to hold this. Hmm. Nay. This is a typical case of uh, what you would see in club level play that they sack a piece, they have a hanging group, and all they think is, oh my god, we need to recuperate, we need to recuperate. Yeah. And Aaron Young goes, bring it on, baby. And he just adds another 75 ton of fuel to the fire. The incredible concept behind it is actually not very deep. What he wants to do is to take on d4 with a queen, thereby allowing this beautiful smothered mate. When I say it's not really that deep, of course, this is yet another move that I more than likely would have failed to find. But once again, it is probably when he played bishop c5, I can guarantee you 100% he saw this. Because that's just the logical way to continue. And in fact, neither piece can really be taken. If they take here, the mate is still on. And if they take on um, c5, then after queen d4 check, king here, knight f2 takes queen takes yet another total domination the twin mate threats can't be prevented mind-boggling stuff and so Anan took on g4 check and he just casually took back that's it and if you ask yeah yeah but what's black threat now well queen h4 and then mate and in the most normal chess games where both players are really doing their very best and don't commit any obvious blunders and mistakes like white it would be difficult to point out where his mistakes were you would think that yeah this takes forever mate considering that you are not exactly standing too well materially but not the case there is no time for white to organize his pieces to put up any resistance against this so after the knight g4, the best he could do was to actually take on f8, and it's quite a sneaky defending move. I think, I have a feeling I missed the line. I wanted to show you something else here. Was it this one? No. No. This one? That wasn't the line, was it? How did I get there? Oh, that's the actual game. Okay, um, I've, I seem to recall that I found another analogous line with uh, the um, Rob Levy game, but I just can't recall which one it was. Yeah, it wasn't this. Sorry, guys, I'm trying to get my act together. 
Yeah, that, those were some very spectacular stuff. Anyway, let's go back to the game. Maybe it will come to me. Maybe I have already shown it to you. I've got so much stuff in my head I can't remember. So, bishop e2, knight e5, bishop takes, bishop takes, knight takes g4, knight f8. And now queen here probably would have lost the game for black because of the very sneaky counter check defense. <laughs> Lovely stuff. And um, white emerges with an exchange up, although even here black has got a fair bit of play. But that was not to happen. Once you lose a rook, you just go like, yeah, no worries. I will just play f5, thank you very much. Completely killing this queen. Completely killing the knight too. So this knight goes nowhere. Even if we consider the fact that it's pinned, it's just beautiful to see how this bishop remains absolutely uncontested throughout the whole game and proves to be more valuable than a lot of other pieces on the board on the white side. And f5 is simply just going like, yeah, I'm a Ruka, down, no one cares. And I am, the only threat I have is queen h4, which is still not really a threat. The threat is that after queen h4, I'm threatening with mate on h2, and yet there is no more defense to be found. Once again, notice how the two bishops are absolutely killing here, so we can't stop any of these threats. The knight is pinned, it can't go. There's nothing left in the tank, and the logical looking knight e6 just accelerates white's fate. Boy, oh boy. So once again, the best move was played, the only one knight g6 to prevent queen h4, and black just casually went, hmm, I'm cool. Queen f6 is going to take on um, g6, and then recreate the mate threat on h2. Uh, and there is absolutely nothing to be done against this. Takes three moves. One, two, three. White has got three moves at complete liberty to do whatever he pleases and he just can't stop this threat. Absolutely amazing chess. He tried h3, the knight was taken. Now the threat is to come up and take it. Note that the knight can never be captured because of the mate. So he played queen e2. Bring the queen closer to the defense. And after queen h5, he played queen d3. I suppose that by this stage, he must have been in severe time trouble as well. So now the queen is guarding the mate. And that's where Aronyan put the icing on the cake by putting the bishop on e3, thereby cutting the queen off. And now there is no way to defend queen takes h3 anymore. So the most likely finish would have been bishop takes, queen takes, and then we can choose between these two mates. A very fitting end. Wow, this, this was really, really next level stuff and a beautiful game to demonstrate the idea of development, attack, purposefully, purposefully develop pieces. And just the whole concept of one army simply dominating the other by sheer better placement and better coordination. It is a very difficult concept to grasp. It's reasonably easy when you play through a game like this and you see the lines, it's all explained, you get it. But when you want to play like this, it's not even GM level, it's beyond that. I would never ever be able to pull off a game like that unless I had got two days to think about every single move. And someone would tell me that, hey dude, you have a chance here to create a masterpiece. Like there is no way that um, even 2600s, I would doubt whether they would be able to pull off this many amazing... Like from here on, from C5 on, they are all moves that would have required incredible depth in calculation. This is truly amazing. An absolute beautiful example of what 21st century chess is about when it's played well. And once again, an even bigger testament to this whole masterpiece is the fact that the white player was a world champion. Amazing. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I highly recommend you to play through both games more than once to make sure that you don't miss any of the little details and beautiful variations. And um, I will be back with more soon. Thanks for watching.